So now let's get to a projectile motion problem. Now the first fundamental thing that you have to remember about projectile motion is that in the x direction, the velocity is always constant. I mean, think about this for a second. What's acting on it in the y direction? What makes the object fall? Gravity, so there's a force. But what force is acting in the x direction? There is no force in the x direction because we assume that there's no resistance due to air. So if there's no force in the x direction, there's nothing that can change its velocity because a force causes an object to accelerate. And an acceleration is a change in velocity. So the x component of the velocity is always constant. And you need to remember that because that helps you solve the problems. But in the y direction, you have a change in velocity because of gravity. The force of gravity is changing the velocity of the object. So what we have here is a person standing on a cliff and the person throws a projectile, we'll just say a ball, horizontally off the cliff. This horizontal speed of the object is 10 meters per second and it falls a distance of 100 meters. So the question is asking, how far from the base of the cliff does the ball land? Well, let's go over to our table and write down our, our, our uh, given information. So again, you can choose your coordinate system. You can choose this is zero and it falls a negative 100 meters, or you can choose the ground is zero and it's elevated 100 meters above the ground. Either way works, whatever you're most comfortable with. Me, I like to choose the ground is zero and it's elevated 100 meters. But sometimes, do what's uncomfortable. That's how you're always pushing the envelope of understanding. So, let's just get out of our comfort zone for a second, and we'll choose up here is zero, and down here is negative 100 meters below zero. So, our initial position in the x direction or is zero, because I'm gonna choose relative to here, this is zero, and this is whatever my delta x is. So we don't know what the final, velocity, the, the final position is because that's what we're trying to find out. Our initial velocity in the x direction is 10 meters per second, and our final velocity in the x direction is 10 meters per second. Why are they the same? Because we said earlier, the velocity doesn't change in the x direction. So the initial velocity and the final velocity in the x are gonna be the same number because there's no change. But that also tells us, without having to be told explicitly, that tells us that our acceleration in the uh, x direction is zero. Because remember, acceleration is defined as change in velocity with respect to time. If there was no change in the velocity, then there can be no acceleration. Do we know the time? No, we don't. We were not told the time, so we'll just put a question mark. Now, let's fill up the y component of our table. What do we know initially? We know initially it's at uh, a position of zero, and it falls to a position of negative 100 meters. Because remember, in our problem, we define zero in the y, as up here, therefore it fell 100 meters below the zero mark, hence it's negative. We know its initial velocity in the y, and this is key. When the ball was thrown, it was 10 meters horizontally, but that velocity is relative to the x-axis. But since it was horizontal, that means that there was no y component of velocity. So we know its y component of velocity in the y, its y component is zero. Do we know what the speed is when it hits the ground? That we do not know. So that will be a question mark. We do know that the object uh, accelerates at a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, if you're getting ready for the MCAT, the MCAT assumes, it rounds up and assumes that gravity is 10 meter, negative 10 meters per second. If you're in a physics class, nine times out of 10, they're gonna say, they're gonna use the, 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 the accepted constant, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Either way, it's still considered G, or the constant for gravity.
So, and again, we don't know the time. That's the first thing that I want you to really get practice doing for this type of problem. Look at the given information and get comfortable setting up your table. But let's go on with the problem. How do we solve these type of problems? Here is the key to doing a projectile motion problem. The time that it takes to fall from up here to the ground is the exact same time that it takes to go from the base of the cliff to some distance out. At, because the thing about projectile motion is, as it's falling, it's moving over. That's what makes it a projectile. So the time that it takes to move over is the same time that it takes to fall. So if we can solve for the time using our information in the y-axis, we can use that time to get the distance that it moves in the x-axis. Now let me very quickly show you why you cannot use the x-axis to solve the problem. Let's just say that we use our second equation to solve for the x. So v squared equals v naught squared plus two a delta x. What was our acceleration in the x? It's zero. Therefore, this term goes away and you have v squared is equal to v squared. Well, we already knew that. We don't learn anything from that. So that shows you that you can't use the x direction. So now, let's use the y. But what equation do we use? Well, the first thing that we need to know from the y direction is how long does it take to fall? Why? Because we could use that time to find, to use in the x direction to see how far it goes over. So, ask the first question. Which equation tells us what we need to know? The first equation has time in it. The last equation has time in it. So now we ask the second question. Do I have what the equation needs to give me the answer that I want? The first equation needs an initial and a final velocity. The second equation only needs an, um, the time, I'm sorry, it only needs the initial and final position because we're solving for the time. And it needs acceleration. Well, we know that. And we also know the initial velocity. So it rules out the first equation and we know for a fact we have to use the third one. So therefore, but instead of saying it in the x, we'll just say that it's in the y. So delta y, and I say delta y because if this was a y here, I brought it over. Delta y is equal to v naught t minus one half g t squared. Why did this go from positive to negative? Because it's accelerating in the negative y direction. So your g term is actually a negative, and you bring out the g, since these are all multiplied by each other, it changes the sign of the, po uh, the positive to a negative. Now, we need to solve for t, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to need a quadratic equation because I, have, I can't factor out t from this. I need the quadratic. Guess what? You don't need the quadratic. Why? What was the initial velocity in the y direction? Oh, wow. The initial velocity was zero. This term goes away. So now the change in position in the y is equal to one half, negative one half, gt squared. So we're looking for the time, so we solve for t. We bring the two over by multiplying both sides by two. And then we bring the g over by dividing both sides by g. So you're left with t squared. So therefore, the square root of 2y over g, and that's a negative g, by the way, equals t. Well, you're saying, well, you can't take the square root of a negative number. It's cool. Because when you do your solution for delta y, you will find out that that gives you a negative number. A negative number over a negative number, the negatives cancel, so you'll have a positive time. If you get a negative number, you know you did something mathematically wrong because one, you can't have a negative square root and there's no such thing as negative time. Well, don't let the theoretical physicists get on me for that one. You won't have to worry about a negative t when it comes to general physics problems or the MCAT. So anyway, now you have your t value. So if you th plugged your numbers in, you now know t. Well, if you know t in the, in the y, you know t in the x. 
So now let's solve our problem and get out of here. <laughs> now we're going to find out what's the distance in the x. What's the first question we ask? Right. Which equation tells me what I need? Well, the first equation doesn't have an x. The second equation we already found out doesn't work because a and the x is 0. So we're left with the third equation. So therefore, delta x equals v naught t uh, plus 1 half a t squared. What's the acceleration in the x direction? Oh, wow. It's 0. So therefore, this term goes to 0. So now we have delta x equals v naught t. We want to know what delta x is. Well, we know what the initial velocity is in the x. It's 10 meters per second. We now know what the time is in the x because we can solve for it. So therefore, your delta x becomes the initial velocity in the x direction times the time that you would have solved for from the y. And there you have your answer. I know we covered a lot in this problem, but just remember the fundamentals. One, the velocity in the x is always constant. Two, if you need to use time, you're going to get it from the y direction and then apply it to the x direction. And three, ask the two fundamental questions of your kinematic equations. Does the equation give me or does it have what I need? And then the second question is, do I have what the equation needs to get the answer that I want? If you do all of that, I feel confident that you're going to get to the right answer. Let's look forward to another problem in the next series.